was the post-lunch session here on the first day of the Humans to Mars Summit. Coming to you from Washington, D.C., specifically the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, I called it a temple of science earlier today, never more so than uh, with the Humans to Mars discussion, and particularly that discussion that just took place about uh, robotic precursors, precursors, of course, to humans, footsteps, uh, boots on Mars. Uh, but the only way that we've explored Mars so far, and uh, a vital role to continue to play as we prepare to uh, send humans there, hopefully before too long. I'm Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society, but I am here, as I've been for the last several years, hosting this live webcast from the Humans to Mars Summit. Humans to Mars Summit is brought to you by, produced by, really, Explore Mars, and uh, this is uh, the wonderful crowning event of the year for Explore Mars that brings together so many people from not just the Mars community, as you have heard, but increasingly uh, across all of uh, space and space development, space exploration, and not just from here in the United States, uh, but uh, from around the world. And uh, you did just hear on that panel that was headed by Ellen Stofan, uh, Sanjay Vajendran, uh, talking about uh, ESA's work to uh, support sample return from Mars. I'm hoping in a moment we'll have uh, Ellen's other guest, who was just on stage, Lori Glaze, who heads NASA's Planetary Science Division now. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more about uh, sample return. Hope to get Sanjay perhaps tomorrow, because of course we have two more full days of the Humans to Mars Summit to bring you uh, tomorrow and uh, Thursday. And so uh, lots more great sessions, lots more terrific people to, uh, to hear from over that period. So since we just had Lori Glaze on stage, oh, she's, she's about to join me now. Lori, stand right over here, right next to me. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, sure. Matt from the Planetary Society. I'm Lori Glaze, nice, nice to see you, thank you. Great session, uh, wonderful to hear that um, we're seeing robotic exploration of Mars and elsewhere in the solar system continue as a very important priority. In fact, an essential priority. You uh, talked about it's almost becoming a cliche, but there aren't enough people who've heard it. It's not humans versus robots, is it? Absolutely not. Uh, it's absolutely humans with robotic exploration. When we go, it's going to be hand in hand. Um, I don't think we can send humans without having the robotic companionship there. That's going to be the best way. So a lot of the discussion that we just heard was about sample return, which has been described, yeah, another cliche, so for so long as the holy grail of Mars exploration. It sounds like with this collaboration with the European Space Agency and perhaps others, we're actually now finally getting to the point where it looks like this may happen. I think you're right. I think we're closer than we've ever been before. Um, we're, we're really, we're working closely together. As Sanjay said when we were on the stage, this is a big endeavor. It's probably something that's uh, too large to do for one agency, but when we work together, uh, that will really help us to, to make sure that we can actually get this done. And I think, as I said, we're closer than we've ever been. We've got a great partnership. We've got some good studies that show the, the feasibility of the concept. And for the first time, we have support from our administration as well. So that's a, a big step forward. This is not an entirely fair question since no one, including you, has really had much time to think about this, perhaps. Although from the inside of NASA headquarters, maybe you've had a little bit more warning. But we had that big announcement from the administrator just yesterday about the augmented or supplemental budget that, with any luck, will allow NASA to reach the moon, put humans back on the moon in 2024. Uh, sample return from Mars still a ways off, probably. Are we now looking at uh, a virtual race between robotic sample return and humans with a shovel? I think if we get the budget that the administrator requested, um, that he mentioned earlier, the, the $1.6 billion that's been uh, the augmentation that's been asked for, I, d I think they're going to get there before we do with uh, Mars sample return, but we're not going to be much behind. Um, I think we're, we're well on a path to, to get us uh, you know, moving towards Mars before the end of the decade. 
And I wonder, I mean, Mars is a big and very diverse place. We probably want samples from a lot of places, don't we? Absolutely. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, as Ellen said a few minutes ago, we're after uh, trying to understand uh, if life evolved on Mars, and if so, how, how far did it evolve, and what kind of locations did it evolve, and that's not going to be just one sample. That's going to be multiple samples. We're going to need uh, hundreds of samples from across the surface to understand what kind of environments uh, these uh, life may have evolved, to understand what time periods that life may have persisted on Mars. Um, so that's going to be a big question. It's going to require a lot of access to the surface. You want a lot of data points. Exactly. You're still fairly new in this job as the head of planetary science in the Science Mission Directorate. Your predecessor, Jim Green, now the chief scientist for the agency. Um, you've got quite a portfolio. I mean, we, I'm with the planetary side. We talk about missions all over the solar system. You want to talk about just a little bit about what's happening all over the neighborhood? I would love to. I think this is an amazing, incredible time for planetary science. It's ac absolutely uh, invigorating when I look across our entire planetary portfolio. Um, so right now, we're not only working towards Mars 2020 to launch next summer in July of 2020. We're also developing the Europa Clipper mission, which is a fantastic mission to go into orbit around Jupiter with multiple passes um, by Europa to map uh, the thickness of the ice shell and try and understand the global ocean underneath, under, understand its salinity, which helps us better understand what types of life might be able to persist in that environment. Um, so that's an incredible mission going on right now in development. We're also working on two missions to fly to small bodies in the solar system. We're working on the Lucy mission, which will go visit um, multiple asteroids that are trapped in Jupiter's orbit, and they're called Trojan asteroids. And there are theories that Jupiter has moved around in the solar system, and as it has moved, it's picked up these different small bodies as in, during its travels, and by visiting multiple different types of asteroids, we'll learn about how Jupiter has moved, if it has, and more about those different types of asteroids and their backgrounds and what they can tell us about seeds for the different planets that have formed. We're also going to be building a mission now called Psyche to go visit a specific asteroid named Psyche, which we believe is um, an iron core, remnant iron core of uh, some protoplanet from, from early in the solar system formation. And so that's a fabulous, fabulous mission as well that's in development. Um, and we hope to have all of these launching within the next about three to four years. So it's an incredibly exciting time. And that's on top of the uh, incredible portfolio that we already have um, in operations, which is probably more than we can talk about right here. Yeah, that flotilla that's above and on the surface of Mars. Uh, pretty cool. Um, we had Nancy Chabot uh, back on the show. She's actually been on twice already this year because we had a panel uh, at the recent Planetary Defense Conference talking about near-Earth asteroids. And um, I'm thinking of one more mission that is coming up, and I bet you know the one I'm talking about. You, I sure do. So thank you for bringing that up. In addition to the science missions, we also have an incredible mission that we're developing right now called the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. And this is a, a key component of our planetary defense program, which is designed to, uh, we have a lot of ground-based um, and some space-based uh, observations to identify and characterize near-Earth objects, uh, but the DART mission is special in that it is going to demonstrate a new technology that has been theorized but hasn't been tested, and that is called the Kinetic Impactor, where it's going to take advantage of uh, a, a, a near-Earth uh, experience by the Didymos asteroid, which is a double asteroid, and the spacecraft is going to impact into the small moon of Didymos, the smaller component, and try and change the orbital period of that small moon and see just how much we can change that period by just transferring momentum to that small moon. And that's going to demonstrate a capability that might allow us in the future, if there were an asteroid that were potentially endangering Earth, if we knew it early enough, we could do a similar type of activity, impact that asteroid, change its orbital period just enough so that it arrives and crosses Earth's path a little before or a little after Earth passes by, thus avoiding a potential impact. So very exciting mission. And like so many of these missions now, there is international cooperation in this one as well, which I didn't know about until the conversation a couple of weeks ago. A CubeSat from uh, ESA? It's from the uh, Italian Space Agency. Oh, it's from Aussie, yes, but there's a CubeSat that they're developing, uh, which will fly along with 
dart um, and then at some point separate because we don't want it to also impact into the Didymos moon. But it will um, take images of the, uh, of the environment and we don't know exactly how that's going to uh, work with the one we're sending, but the idea is to uh, help us to characterize the, the impact event and better understand uh, what our influence was on that asteroid. Uh, you can't play favorites anymore as uh, the head of the entire Planetary Science Division, but I know that you are a Venus person. And uh, Venus, Uranus, Neptune, they gonna get any love? Boy, I hope so. <laughs> you picked the three, the three that have, uh, feel like the poor stepchildren that have been left out in the cold. Uh, but uh, I, I do have a very soft spot in my heart for Venus. Um, I, I, I won't deny that I do believe that, uh, and actually Venus, Uranus, and Neptune, all three are great examples of potential exoplanets that are out there that we keep observing um, now hundreds and thousands of exoplanets, many of which hundreds are in this, those size classes of either Venuses or Earths or in that Uranus-Neptune size. And we really need to understand those examples that are present in our own solar system if we're going to be able to interpret the exoplanet observations that we're making. So um, certainly I would love to see some uh, opportunities to, to do both of those, either you know, a Venus and or uh, something to one of the ice giants, to Uranus and Neptune. We're with you on that. Finally, back closer to home. Uh, if you've seen the logo for the conference today, I mean, the moon is right there between us and Mars. And it seems pretty clear, especially with that announcement last night, that the moon is, and humans on the moon, are very much in our future. You must be pleased to know that the money to accomplish that, that we heard about last night, not going to be taken from science. Absolutely pleased with that. And that's been the, the going in position from the very beginning. As soon as the announcement was made uh, that we were going to try and get to the moon with boots on the ground in 2024, it's been very clear from the administration and from uh, the agency leadership that this is not going to be something that eats into the other programs of NASA, but it's an augmentation. And with that in mind, uh, Science Mission Directorate has been working hand in hand with human exploration to make sure that we are, we're all on the same page, understanding how science can enable exploration and ex exploration can enable science. So we, we really do see this as a, as a joint operation. What are the most important remaining science priorities for the moon? Ooh, the science priorities for the moon uh, really overlap a lot with uh, the other interests in the moon as far as exploration. Uh, one of the key things is really understanding where the water is and what role that plays um, in the lunar history and you know, from a science perspective and then from the exploration perspective, how can we uh, better localize and understand where the water is to um, help us establish sustainable presence on the moon. In situ resource utilization. It overlaps. Absolutely. It's an absolutely overlapping. Trying to understand where the vault are is, is the key question, not only for science, but also for exploration. A lot going on. Thank you very much, Lori. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Matt. You bet. Lori Glaze is the director of the Planetary Science Division in the Science Mission Directorate for NASA. And uh, we are still in our break here, the last afternoon break on the first day of the Humans to Mars Summit, uh, coming to you from Washington, D.C. Uh, I think we're probably going to go to a video. Uh, is it one of those Project Mars videos? Okay. Well, well, just for anybody who didn't hear me explain this earlier, Project Mars, you can find it online, of course, is uh, the result of this competition that was uh, put on, or is the competition, uh, to develop both posters and videos that look toward our future exploration of Mars, and particularly putting humans there. So, of course, it's uh, near and dear to all of us at the Humans to Mars Summit and Explore Mars. And so we're going to take another uh, look at one of those films right now, and uh, we'll be playing these back over the three days of the Humans to Mars Summit. Hope you'll stay with us.